concrete walls There's a place for us Where we could go, where we could be alone Between city lights, we don't have to hide I wanna go, do you wanna follow? There's something in the air, I can't explain it but it's there Ain't nobody gonna find us in our secret love affair I don't wanna have to hide no more, it shouldn't be a fair I wanna go, and I wanna know Do you wanna follow? Oops, I hit the wrong, uh, I hit the wrong, uh, keystroke, and I accidentally stopped the song when I went to unmute my microphone. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the live stream. It is Sunday afternoon. It is 1 p.m., and it's time, oh, that's a perfect time to stop. I crashed. It's time for the Q&A. How are y'all doing today? I hope you're doing well on this, uh, on this Father's Day. For those who celebrate... <laughs> <laughs> oh, just letting you watch a little freestyle uh, that was released on my Patreon page. Um, that is, I'm trying to get a good freestyle edit to kind of highlight how my flying has changed over the uh, over the years, months, weeks, days. While well, I've been doing my three packs a day challenge, uh, so those were some attempts at uh, getting a good freestyle rip, and uh, I mean some of those were not bad. But uh, still, still working on you know the one that I want to share. But I give you a little preview there. <clears throat> Welcome to the live stream, everybody. Um, we are going to start off. Thank you, Mad for at FPV. Love the beard. Hello from Denmark, Rebel twenty eight eighty two. Hello, greetings from Saudi Arabia. Con designer. I have no idea what time it is there. But uh, glad you're here. Glad you're here. Cheap beginner five inch drone asks Chocapic 360. I mean, there's many, many good choices today, but uh, certainly the uh, iFlight Sedora uh, SL5E, I have been ripping the crap out of it. And I feel like for 200 bucks, you get a lot of value there. So, yeah. And that's what we do here. We answer questions. Uh, here's what's going on this is my main screen right here. 
Uh, main, oh wait, hang on, I want to see the analytics. There we go. I need to know how many viewers so I can know how, how much to value myself at. Because the more viewers and the more super chats, and the, that makes you have value as a person. Thank you, 282. I'm a better person now. <laughs> so, we, uh, I'll be checking out your messages here. Best ready to fly for freestyle. Best? I mean, if you really want the best, like you're going to be going with like a bespoke build, like the uh, like Catalyst Machine Works makes kind of a thing. Um, certainly, uh, the uh, my, Mr. Steel Apex, uh, I feel so conflicted about my experience. So let's talk about that for a second. I feel so conflicted because like when I first got the Mr. Steel Apex, I was like, okay, this is just going to be another five inch quad. And then I flew it, and I was like, oh, this is really something special. And maybe that's Kiss, or maybe it's Mr. Steel, or maybe it's a little bit of both. But I was just like, holy crap. And I was really happy. Because when I, whenever I talk, like, everybody expects something from that. And they're like, oh, is Bardwell going to pan it? Is it just, is it, is it interpersonal drama? So if I fly Mr. Steel's quad, and I go, yeah, it's nothing special. Then some people are going to be like, well, he just isn't good enough pilot to notice the difference. Some people would have been like, well, he just, you know, it's that old Mr. Steel Rotor Riot drama again. He could never be objective. So when I flew it and I was like, oh, this is really good. I was really happy to be able to honestly say this quad flies really special because I knew, well, I, I mean, you're never going to escape internet drama. Some people were like, oh, there he goes, kissing Mr. Steel's butt. Like, you can't win. But I was happy because I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm always happy to be able to say nice things about people. And then the ESC popped and I was like, oh, okay, here it goes. So, I mean, best freestyle ready to fly? It's got to be on your list. Although maybe you should install a capacitor or maybe you should uh, use the FetTech ESC instead of the old KISS V2. Anyway, uh, that's what we do, though. That's what we do. I'm going to be answering your questions. Um, now, some people like big oily guy here. Uh, big oily guy, uh, also his username on uh, OnlyFriends. <laughs> oh, sorry, big oily guy. <laughs> kids, kids today, don't don't look up that domain. Big oily guy here is throwing a ten dollars super chat at me, and if you want to do the same, then hit that dollar sign down here to get your question pulled out and make sure that I notice it. Nolan Deckerton, I will. I haven't done the Patreon giveaway yet. I'll be drawing those names today. If you win, you should get an email today, but I haven't drawn that name yet. Um, and so hit the dollar sign, throw a super chat at me, uh, I'll get a little bit, has one way to show your support. And here we go over here in the upper right. These fine people over here are my patrons over on my discord server, uh, patreon.com. There's a link in the video description. If you would like to join these people in, in, in supporting me for as little as $2 a month, $2 a month. Can you, for just the price of a cup of coffee, uh, what does a cup of coffee go for nowadays? Hmm. Sorry, I'm supposed to give you content before I pander. My bad. Thank you, patrons. These guys will be paying attention to their questions, too. All right. So we're going to start. We're going to start, though, with some news of the week. News of the week. The report of the week, some might say. No, that's a, that's a different YouTuber. I actually have some news this week. I've been saving up. And a lot of times I go into the live stream, I'm like, what happened this week? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Let's just do the live stream. Let's get some news out of the way, though. Here's the first piece of news that I want to talk about. Fat Shark Bite Frost. Oops. Fat Shark Bite Frost. Uh, a little while ago, can I not zoom in? Why can't I zoom? There we go. A little while ago, Fat Shark said, hey, bite for, for the new Bite Frost is almost ready. We're going to be sending it to you soon. Then they said, no, and it's not ready. And then they made this post. Uh, so Bite Frost has been delayed. Uh, and if you guys can read the text while I talk. But if you read between the lines here, one of the things that Bite Frost struggled with compared to DJI was its range. And one of the reasons for that was that it had lower output power. I believe the Bite Frost beta was like 450 milliwatts. DJI goes up to 700 milliwatts or even more if you do that little 1200 milliwatt hack. Um, and you know, there's no substitute for output power at the end of the day. You do everything else right, more output power will get you more range. Well, it seems like if you read between the lines here, they have been having problems with heat dissipation and higher RF output. I, 
I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to get output power to bring their range more close to the DJI range. But of course, the problem is you get heat buildup. And everybody knows the air unit, the DJI air unit is big and heavy and hot. And bite frost is smaller and lighter. But, you know, at the end of the day, you have to be able to dissipate the heat, and that seems to be where they are struggling. So uh, they have done the right thing. Rather than release a half-assed product that doesn't deliver, they are pushing it off. But he says, unfortunately, I can no longer say how long it'll take to finish. It could be one month. It could be four. That's really discouraging to everybody out there who is waiting for Bite Frost to give them an alternative to DJI. But it is... And unfortunately, here's the real problem. The longer it takes for them to put something out, the more people who are waiting just go, all right, screw it, I'll get DJI. And it's not like DJI is just sitting there going, well, we got this. DJI is also improving and developing and working on V2. So I fear that by the time, by the time like a Bite Frost V1 comes out, DJI will just be like, okay, here's DJI V2, ready? Boom! And just put the freaking foot down. But that's the news about that. What else we got for news of the week? Well, here's the next thing we got. Um, I wanted to put this in the news of the week so as many people as possible could see it. If you're in the United States, you can get upgraded ribbon cables. Now, uh, Grace and Hobby isn't the only place to have these. Uh, there are a couple other shops that have them. Um, I don't know them. I don't have the links off the top of my head. Grayson Hobby has it at least. You can also get it from Jumper's AliExpress store. Uh, it's a little more shipping, though. What they did is they just shipped a big crate of these over to the Get FPV and it, or not Get FPV. Grayson Hobby both start with a G. They sh and uh, if you have a Jumper T16 and well, really everyone should do this who has a jumper T16, even if you haven't had a problem yet. I guess if your jumper has been completely flawless, but if you, you may not, but if you have had problems with your ribbon cables and your buttons, then basically for the price of shipping, you get a new set of upgraded, heavier, heavy duty ribbon cables, and this helps with the problem. You shouldn't have to go in there and do this, but at least they're doing something to try to make this right. So... So check that out. If you're in the U.S., Grayson Hobby is a great place to go. If you're outside of the U.S., Jumper has an AliExpress store, and uh, yeah, you can get that. Skadoosh in the chat says, did everyone see Bruce's last rant on the FAA advisory meeting? DJI was the only one who stood up for the hobbyists. No, I didn't see that, but uh, I, that's fascinating. Um, I've said, you know, the, the, the head legal counsel for DJI is Brendan Schulman. He is the lawyer who defended Trappy against the FAA. Like, what more bona fides do you need than that? Anyway, that sounds interesting. Uh, yeah. Uh. RC Flyer says, yeah, the AMA guy was not interested at all. Ouch. Yeah, they live stream those. Do they live stream those meetings? Is that where people are getting this info? Because I don't want to be repeating bad info. Um, moving on with the news. And by the way, we will start getting to your questions very soon. But uh, moving on, got a few more news items I want to tell you about. This is a big one. If you're using JESC, if you're using JESC, uh, this is a screenshot from a GitHub that one of my patrons shared on the Discord server. If you are f using JESC Configurator to flash your ESC and you accidentally click the flash button twice, it bricks the ESC, and the only way to get it back is to reflash the ESC using the C2 interface and an Arduino, which I know all of you have laying around. In other words, if you're using JESC, don't double-click the flash button. There is a fix for this in JESC Configurator coming soon. Yeah, that's kind of a big deal. Hello? Uh, how did that happen? Oh, well, I guess mistakes happen. Um, yeah. So, don't do that. And last item on the news. Oh, yeah. So the last item on the news has to do with my Jumper T18 review. And by the way, 
when the jumper t18 when i tested you got it got those jumper t6 uh the t18 and the radio master on behind me when i tested the range of the t18 i got a lot shorter range to fail safe than the t16 but i acknowledged in the video that my test conditions were not like ideal there were hills and valleys and trees but you know what are you going to do where is a place you can go i don't live in the freaking salt flats where i can just go so um i, I I'm thinking about a way to do a better range test. I stand by that result. It just is what it is. And I stand by the expectation that a PCB-based antenna is inherently going to do worse than like an, a, a dipole antenna. That's just, that's just how it usually is. Unless they went to like a half wave or something, it's going to be worse. But I acknowledge there are better ways to do that testing, and, and maybe we'll do that. But I said in that video that... The difference in power between 100 milliwatts and 300 milliwatts is the same as the distance between 300 and 500. And many people in my comments jumped up to say 100 to 300 is 200 milliwatts. 300 to 500 is 200 milliwatts. So is that the same distance? And the answer is no. And I just want to get this out there because I've had to answer this many times. Um, and the reason for that is that RF output power is measured logarithmically. It's on a, a, a nonlinear scale. If you're using decibels, then it's linear. That's the point of decibels. So the way you, that you need to think about that is not 300 minus 100 is 200, 500 minus 300 is 200, therefore they're the same. The way you need to think about that is that 300 is more than twice 100. 100 times 2 is 200 and 300 is more than that 500 is less than twice 300 300 times 2 is 600 and that is 500 is less. so in terms of range and output power in terms of decibels 500 is closer to 300 than 300 is to 100 now that that's out you need four times the power to go twice as far david skadoosh it's the inverse square law you need quadruple the power to double the range. That's, that's, there's more, you, you could get other ratios, but that's the ratio I always remember. So if you want to double your range, you go from 100 to 400 milliwatts and you double the range. From 300 to 1200 milliwatts is double the range. That's how you do it. Mm. Okay, so that's the news of the day. Now let's start taking your questions. And the question I see right here is from Drone Playground asking, do you plan to put Betaflight Flight Controller and ESC on the Mr. Steel Quad and test how it is to fly? Yeah, I want to do that. I think probably the first thing I'm going to do is change out the ESC since the ESC got fried anyway. I would love to get a FetTech ESC and put it in there. I don't want to put another one of these KISS V2 ESCs because they're only rated to 5S and they're only rated for 25 amps. And it just seems like everybody who I've talked to who uses KISS says, don't use that ESC, use the FETTECH ESC. Uh, but no, I can't find the FETTECH 30 millimeter ESC in stock anywhere. So maybe I'll put a BL Heli ESC in there with the, F, with the KISS flight controller and see how it changes. But that would actually, I would love to change the camera first. Mr. Seal suggested that the latency of his camera had something to do with how confident I felt flying into tight environments. But actually, the latency of his camera is, it's good for a CCD camera. It's about, I think it's about 16 milliseconds. Um, I think that, does Oscar Leong have that up on his website? Hang on. Like, CCD cameras have not traditionally been spectacular. No, I don't see the steel camera up here. I don't know which exact camera it is. It may be just a rebadged other camera, but I don't see it on here. I've been hearing that it's about 16 milliseconds. It, 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 worth pointing out that C, there are some CMOS cameras like the Runcam Racer that have like four millisecond latency. So the idea that he uses a CCD camera because of its low latency, there's CMOS cameras with way lower latency. So there must be something else to it. Um, but the latency of that camera is good, but not like world-class good like the run cam racer so 
anyway, I'd love to change the camera out like for a low for a higher latency camera and see how much that mattered. Let's see here. INV says, do you know if Access still has an EU and an FCC version? Why can't we choose when we download the firmware? INV, there is an EU and an FCC version. They haven't done anything like Flex firmware with R9. I believe, though, what you do is you download a single zip file, and then you just, you just flash the, all the firmwares in one file. Yeah. Um, Evil21 is asking about the Luminaire Duo antenna. Let's talk about that. I've been I've been testing this antenna for a couple weeks. Um, this is an interesting antenna because it's labeled as a patch antenna, but it's actually not a patch antenna. Um, the problem with a with an actual patch antenna is that the the efficiency of the antenna there. That's a good picture to show. The efficiency of a patch antenna goes way down. So for the same size of antenna, you get less gain or less beam width. Um, this is actually not a patch antenna. Hang on, let me switch back to my own screen. I'm going to show you a picture, but I have to dig through some private messages to find the picture. So I'm going to, I'm not going to show you the private messages. Um, because when I saw when I, when, when Luminaire set, sent me this antenna, I said, well, I've been liking the crosshair antenna because it's not a patch antenna and it, it has better efficiency. So this is a picture of what's inside the Lumineer Duo. And although it is printed from a circuit board, the ground plane and the active element are not printed onto the same PCB, and that's the key. That's the key difference. It's air-gapped and uh, has pretty good performance. Um, it, it, all of these vertical-style antennas, though, they have a lower vertical beam width, and means if you drop your head a lot, you're going to have an issue. So these, d these two stacked elements give you more penetration at the expense of vertical beam width. So if you commonly drop your head, you're, you might not like this one quite as much. But Let me get some super chats out of the way. We got a few super chats coming in. I certainly don't want to make these lovely people who spent some money wait. Um, Alan Lag Lagerquist, thanks for $5. Alan, happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you. If you're a father, if you're a father out there, happy Father's Day. I, uh, I asked my family if there was anything special that I should know about that might, I might need to cancel my live stream to make room for. They said, what are you talking about? I said, you know something about today that might be unique? And they said, it's Sunday. You have a live stream. I'm like okay. <laughs> Big oily guy. Thanks for ten bucks. Happy Father's Day. Thanks for the content. Choke a pick. Three sixty. Thanks for two dollars and a, a a nice little sticker. Dennis Durakovich. Thanks for fifty. Oh, hang on. Now, Dennis, I read your name as Durakovich, thinking it was like uh, I guess that's like Eastern European, but you're paying me in Swedish kroner, so now I think I'm saying your name wrong. Durakovic. I don't know. Thank you for 50 kroner. FC only boots when I connect it to the PC and battery at the same time after I accidentally soldered two pads together. Yeah, so you fried the 5 volt regulator is the most likely thing to have happened. Like you soldered 5 volt to ground and uh, most people would replace the flight controller at that point. However, you can power it from an external 5 volt regulator if you want, but most people would just replace the flight controller. Sorry, man. When the flight controller only boots from USB, the 5 volt regulator is probably fried. House of TJ, thanks for five bucks. I got the Wizard X220HV, Betaflight F4 flight controller jumper, T18 jumper, R1 plus receiver. I have the settings right, but no stick inputs in Betaflight. House of TJ, thank you for the $5 donation. Um, I mean, you just got to check the configuration. Uh, you got to check the wiring that the SBUS out wire from the jumper is going. On that flight controller, I'm pretty sure there's just an RC input. It's a single input for any uh, for any receiver type that you're using. But then, I mean, you say you have the settings right, but no stick inputs. I mean, it's either the wiring is wrong or the settings are wrong. Um, or, I mean, obviously the receiver's bound, right? Um, the problem is with an F4 flight controller, knowing which pad to put the receiver on, 
and then which UART to use can be tricky. Uh, we're not going to go through this step by step here on the live stream, but if you want to email me, I'll be happy to work through it with you. Yeah, just email me about that, House of TJ. Chocopic360, thank you for a dollar. Justin French, thanks for five dollars. I lifted a motor pad on your JB Flight Controller. Can I remap another pad to be, oh, a motor sensor pad? Mm, Justin French, are you talking about the, the ESC telemetry pads? Uh, the good news is that if you're talking about ESC telemetry, all of the four ESC telemetry pads are the same. They're all UART 4RX. So if it's ESC telemetry, then you could just solder that to any of the others and you're fine. They're all, they all go to the same pad. Um, if it's a motor output, I would remap the LED strip pad uh, to be the motor output. Team Gantam, thank you for $2 in the super chat. At what point should one graduate from 3-inch to 5-inch? Um, Team Gantam, if you feel like you can fly a 3-inch competently, like you can take off, control your throttle, land without crashing, then you're, you're ready to go to a 5-inch. It'll have more power. The throttle will be a little different, but you probably will have enough control of the quad to avoid like just losing it entirely or d dumping it into the ground. Just go slow. Keep the rates low and be careful with the throttle and you'll be fine. Squishy7 says the Axi patch is the same way. Interesting, I didn't know that about the Axi patch. It's also not a patch. They call it a patch because people think of any flat antenna as a patch, but it's not actually what it is. Grim in the Discord says, I've done a new build using the Seal Racing F7 and the Seal Racing 45 Amp ESC. The quad was rebooting on hard flips and rolls. Figured it was a flight controller, so I swapped in an old Riot control. No longer rebooting, but the camera rebooted. Well, Grim, when you have a situation like that, uh, it is usually... If it's the, like the camera and the video transmitter, then it's the voltage regulator, which is usually what's rebooting. Um, if the whole quad power cycles, including the ESC, that tells you that the, the battery is coming unplugged. Because the, the ESC is plugged directly into the battery, right? So if you hear the ESC go doo doo doot, then that tells you that the whole battery came unplugged somehow. And the number one way that that happens is that the prongs inside your XT60 get loose. And then when you do a sharp move, it just kind of disconnects slightly. Um, you can spread those prongs back out again with like a Phillips screwdriver. Just poke it in there and kind of squeeze them out. It's easy to overdo it, so don't go don't go crazy. Um, some people will put like a toothpick or a piece of silicon wire insulation inside the XT60 to keep the prongs from doing that. Um, if just the camera or video transmitter is rebooting, then the number one uh, explanation is that the sharp motor movement causes a spike of current and it causes the regulator to brown out. That's a, that's a problem with the regulator design. You might could put a capacitor on the regulator uh, output and help with that, but uh, yeah, those are some, some thoughts about that. James Vaulton, thank you for $10 in Super Chat. After I crashed into the ground and flipped on my iFlight DC5, I have stuttering and twitching after throttling. Everything's very tight and the pins are the same. Any idea? Well, James, the number one thing I would look for is damage to the frame. Cracked, delaminated carbon, loose screws. I know you said everything's tight, so you check that, but I'm just listing it off. Broken standoff, allowing the flight controller to vibrate. Any additional source of vibration. You sometimes have to pull the quad apart to find a cracked frame or something. But if you are 100% convinced there's no physical damage to the quad, then the next cause is that the the shock damaged the gyro and the flight controller may need to be replaced i know that's not what you want to hear uh that's the last thing i mean it's easy to just say i oh, just replace replace parts but anytime you you anytime the quad is flying fine and then you crash and now it's not flying fine number one piece of advice i have is don't change the configuration i had somebody message me the other day and he said i i, I was uh trying to take off in the grass I was like chopping grass up with my blades. And I was like, oh, let's not do that. So I disarmed, I picked the quad up, I set it down over here and I went to arm and the receiver wasn't working. And the very next thing he did was he reflashed Betaflight. And I'm like, stop, back up. 
your beta flight configuration didn't get messed up spontaneously between the moment you disarmed and picked the quad up and you set it down over there. So you're, you're barking up the wrong tree and you're just causing more problems for yourself. You know your configuration was working. Then something happened and now the quad doesn't work, but your configuration didn't change. So don't waste time, uh, Josh. Uh, no, not Josh, sorry, James, James Valton. Don't waste time trying to figure, like change your PIDs and your filters. It was flying fine, then you crashed, now it's broken. Your PIDs didn't change, your PIDs are fine. Something is broken about the quad and your troubleshoot has to be to figure out what broke and then fix it. Adam Nuclear, thank you for 200, what's a CZK? Check Karuna, okay. Uh, thank you, Adam. Do you plan to manufacture your parallel charge board again? It's unavailable everywhere. Um, Adam, the place that will have it is ReadyMade RC. They're the manufacturer. Um, it may be that many resellers are not ordering it for whatever reason. Does ReadyMade RC have it in stock? Uh, in stock, yeah. It's in stock right now at ReadyMade RC. So you can go pick this up right now at ReadyMade RC. Now, if you're in, uh, in the Czech Republic, you may want to order from a European reseller. And the problem is that like, they have to order it and carry it. And if they're not doing that, then, I mean, we can't, like, f we can't force them. You have to ask your local reseller to order it for you. That's the thing. Kabir Saxena, thank you for 100 uh, rupees, I believe. New to FPV, pick one. Would you buy Fat Shark goggles and a 3 inch drone, or buy the Eosheen box goggle and build a 5 inch 4S? I mean, that's. I would probably go with number one. Because Fat Shark goggles, you're just going to be able to keep forever. And the three-inch drone, you're going to keep forever. Three inches are fun to fly, not just as learning tools. If you buy the Eosheen box goggle, it is good, but you will outgrow it. And maybe later you'll want a Fat Shark. So I would stick with number one, which gets you stuff you're going to keep using forever, as opposed to number two, where you're starting with something that you, and you know you're going to outgrow. And the three inch, you'll learn to fly it. It'll be, yeah, I probably would take Fat Shark goggles and a three inch over an Eosheen goggle and a five inch. Because you'll build a five inch in a, a few months anyway, and you'll be fine. But you won't throw the three inch out. Peter Martinez, thank you for $5 in the super chat. Does it make sense to switch to RC smoothing interpolation and tune as in your black box tutorial or leave it as a smoothing type filter? Um, Peter, uh, I, I, Betaflight 4.2 has made some huge strides in how feed forward and RC command interact and how the filtering and the smoothing works. It, I would go to Betaflight 4.2. That's one of the main areas that they improved. And unfortunately, it's like not like a sexy feature that's going to like get a lot of attention. But especially if you're using a very dirty RC input like FreeSky. Uh, R9 is just all over the place with its RC input. The timing is just all over the place. Um, Betaflight 4.2 is going to help smooth that out. Um, now, would you use an interpolation or filtering? I would look at the Betaflight 4.2 tuning notes and just do what they say. And I'm pretty sure they have you change, they give you the option to change the averaging from two to four frames, depending on how much you want to trade off stick response versus smoothing. But they don't recommend like changing it to filter or whatever um they 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 feel like the way to do it is with the interpolation so ben Derry volkov thank you for two dollars am i going to do a naked gopro on the beta 85 or 95 micro do i still have that up there i think i gave that away every month i do a giveaway on my youtube channel along with my new product roundup by the way for those of you who are asking i'm i am going to draw those giveaway winners today the deadline only just passed. Okay, it was like Friday. The deadline passed. I'm going to draw those winners today. I haven't drawn the winners yet. Um, I don't have a quad. I guess maybe the Gep RC would be okay with the Naked GoPro. I'm very interested in the Naked GoPro. Beta FPV, send me a quad with a Naked GoPro. I, I guess, I mean, tearing apart your GoPro 6 is kind of part of the experience. I might like to build it. I don't know. 
I'm very, it's, I'm very intrigued because it's like 25, how much does it weigh? The naked GoPro, it's like 25, 30 grams, right? It's really light. Anyway. Mm. Squishy, Squishy uh, wants to know if I'm using a noise gate. Yeah. So I added some filters to OBS actually. Um, I added some filters to OBS. So there's a little compress. I always, when I make videos in Premiere, I put effects on my voice. Um, uh, but I got a little compressor. I got a little noise gate. How's the noise gate? It's not too annoying, is it? Like there's some air conditioning in the background that I'm cutting out now. Or if I just sit there and <laughs> then you don't have to hear that. Hope it's not too distracting though. Arthur, oh, Arthur, I'm not saying your last name. I'm not even, I'm sorry. It's like, I think it's a Polish name and I can't, I'm not even going to try, man. Sorry. P 50, 50 PLN though. Uh, SuxX Micro F4 12 amp flight tower system. When the camera is not connected, I have black screen with OSD. But after connecting the camera, the whole video feed is gone. Arthur, uh, you should go into the OSD tab and change the PAL and NTSC setting. It defaults to auto, change it to PAL, save, power cycle the whole quad, unplug the battery, unplug USB, all that stuff, plug it all back in. If that doesn't work, change it to NTSC. That's usually how you fix that problem. Escobar FPV, thank you for $10 in the super chat. Uh, do you think I was wrong for making the post in the Road Riot page about Steel sounding nuts hating on the DJI in his video? Uh, I didn't see that post so I couldn't, I would defer to the mods. If the mods took action against you, they probably had a good reason. Um, Empty My Mag on You also wants to know, what are your thoughts on Steel's DJI versus Analog video? Um, so yeah, uh, it's a well-known fact that Steel does not like the DJI system. When it first came out, he posted on Instagram, nice try basically. Uh, he also said, I don't think people are gonna switch to this. And he was pretty wrong about that. Um, uh, to be fair, a year before DJI came out, I said digital HD was nearly impossible. So I was wrong about, I mean, I, I still think it was pretty, pretty, pretty difficult, but he pulled it off. Uh, DJI pulled it off. Um, here's the thing about Steel. His criticism of the DJI system, some of it is on point, but what he is missing is that he is a really exceptional and unique FPV pilot. I thought of this when I was flying his ready to fly. There were just like, his ready to fly comes without smart audio enabled. And I'm like, well, how do you change channels? And he's like, I, I don't, I just, it's true. He flies on, I think it's F7 is just his channel. Everywhere he goes, he flies on F7. And if he's flying by himself, that's fine. If he's with a big group of people, he, like he came to, um, Rotorite Rampage. He just shows up and he says, hey, I'm on F7. Can I go up? And everybody's like, okay. And then everybody just gets out of his way and he flies. He puts a couple packs in. He entertains everybody. He show, you know, shows his skill. And then he's like, thank you. And I'm like, so he doesn't ship his quad with smart audio because he doesn't use smart audio. He's like, I don't know. If I need to change channel, I'll just poke it with a... With a I'm like, oh, you just use smart audio. So he is way down this road and if you want to and so when he criticizes the dji system it's not coming from a perspective of a typical fpv pilot so that's the first thing to keep in mind um and in some ways it's like uh, uh, uh it's like a a musician who only records to analog eight track tape and maybe that's because as an engineer, he has 20 years of experience recording the analog tape and he just doesn't know the digital workflow, right? Or maybe it's because there's something about analog tape that works with the way, with, with the way he, and it just produces a result that works for him. So when he criticizes DJI, some of it is because he's, but some of his criticisms are completely off base and just reflect the fact that he hasn't used the system in the real world. My, the best example of that is the claim that it just fail safes with no warning. And if you use the DJI system, the first time you use it, it fail safes with no warning and you're like, WTF is going on here. But then you learn how to know when fail safe is coming and not keep going and then it's fine. So. 
Mm. That's my thought. Of, I have one more thought about that. I'm going to say one more thought about that. When DJI first came out, I flew it and I thought, oh, this is there's something going on here. This is pretty interesting. And I thought to myself, how many normal people are going to spend this money on it? And I, maybe nobody. And now that we're almost a year in, it's clear that a lot of normal people think it's the best thing to ever happen to FPV. And no matter what my personal feelings are about DJI, whenever I review a product, I, I tell you my personal feelings, but I also know that not everybody's going to agree with me. And I try and give you the information you need to decide if it's right for you. But the more I see that everybody, practically everybody, every like normal person who uses it, not like Alex Vanover, who's like the top, a world-class racer, not like Mr. Steele, who is like this highly refined freestyle pilot, but just normal people who use it. And then they just go, I'm never flying analog again. You have to acknowledge that that's a reality. And the thing is, especially talking to beginners, you say, oh, it's not right for beginners. He's doing a beginner series. But I've seen so many beginners use it, love it, feel like it was the right decision for them. And you got to ask yourself why and why are you trying to talk them out of it? Anyway, okay, enough about that. <clears throat> Arctic Ice Drone, thanks for 55 New Region Kroner. Can you suggest a PID tuning approach for a 7-inch with Insta 361X? Um, Arctic Ice Drone, the first thing I would do with a 7-inch is I would probably bring the filter sliders down from 1.0 because those 7-inch props are going to have lower RPM. You're probably going to need more filtering. Um, maybe you're going to want a higher eye gain for a cinematic to stiffen it up. And also, look at my video about PID tuning for stick feel. Perfect stick feel, I think I called it where I talk about using iTerm Relax to adjust the stick feel. That's where I would start there. Josh Goble, thank you for $5 in the super chat. Happy Father's Day, been using DJI goggles with analog, haven't had any issues with lag. What's your experience with them on analog? Um, Josh Goble, uh, I, I, I also think that the lag issue has mostly been fixed. If you're very latency sensitive, you might notice a small amount of additional latency, but in general, it's pretty good. Okay, we're caught up on the Super Chats. Stop giving me so many Super Chats, guys. Because it makes it look like I only respond to Super Chats and not the, not the regular questions. So it's just don't, don't send so many Super Chats. It's just said no YouTuber ever. I, uh, a couple people are asking how I got the milliamp hour counter on the SL5E to work. I, I don't know. It just worked out of the box. Like, all I changed on that quad was the rates. And obviously, I set up the, the flight modes. I didn't change anything. It just worked out of the box. Um, so, I mean, I guess you could look at my configuration. But it's just the stock configuration. Mr. Huggy, I think you're exactly right. You get great musicians that only use their instrument because they know it inside and out, like as an extension of their body. That's Mr. Steel's quad and Mr. Steel. I 100% agree with you. I think that's why Steel flies the CMOS or the CCD camera, even though CMOS cameras ha can have lower latency. It's not the latency. It's just that's where he's at. How long did he fly the alien before he switched to the Apex? Years he flew the alien. He sticks with the gear that works with him and gives him the results he wants. But that doesn't mean that because it works for him that it's the best for everybody. And I think that DJI is a place where that approach definitely shows. So. Okay. Marciano027 in the Discord wants to know, is there a way in OpenTX to set the quad voltage alarm per cell instead of full voltage? Um, in OpenTX. Oh, I see, Marciano. Um, Marciano, it depends on the receiver and the telemetry system that you're using. Um, if you have FreeSky smart port telemetry, for example, there is a cell voltage sensor. If it's like A4 or A2, I can't remember which sensor it is. But just look at your telemetry sensors and one of them will be like, 
you know, 16.8 volts, that's VFAS. And one of them will be like 4.2 volts, and that's your vo cell voltage sensor. Um, if your telemetry system doesn't send that data, like for example, Crossfire, Crossfire, give me average cell voltage, please. It doesn't do it. It only gives you RX bat, which is your battery voltage. But then you can't do it, as far as I know. Um, I guess you could do it. I saw one guy who created a very elaborate series of logical switches that would basically set a global variable to determine what cell voltage, how many cells it was. But it's just, it was so complicated and not really worth it. Hmm. Dennis asks, the Q&A live stream has very valuable content. Have you considered to do basically a table of contents after the live stream? Yes, Dennis. Uh, what I've said in the past is if you make a table of contents with timestamps, I will put it in the video description. But I'm not going to go back and rewatch the whole two-hour live stream just to create a table of contents for you. So anyone who thinks that's a good idea, write down the table of contents and I will put it in. I will happily do that. But if it's not worth it to at least one of the nearly 600 and, 650 people, 650 of you are watching this right now. If not one of you feels like it's worth it to write down the table of contents, then I'm not going to go spend two hours doing it. No offense. In, uh, in the Burning Man community, there's a concept called a duocracy. A duocracy. A democracy is that the leaders are voted for, right? A kleptocracy is that all your friends get the power, uh, etc. A duocracy is that the people who are in power are the people who step up to actually do things. So saying, why doesn't someone do this? You say that at a, at a, at a Burning Man uh, event. You go, why isn't anybody doing this? Someone will go, that's a good idea. Looking, I, I think you should do that. And that's what I'm saying here. <laughs> hmm. Um, big data pimp thank you for five dollars my 1507 motors are hot rpm filter is on and the sliders in the middle i've tried changing the pids and it's still hot uh, big data pimp a lot of times on these three inch quads especially if you're flying with a big battery especially if you're flying with a gopro the motors are just a little overworked and they're going to be hot if you have hot motors that are hot regardless of the PIDs, regardless of the filters, it just means the motors are working hard. And uh, as long as they're not like like super hot, you're probably fine. You might try going to a lower pitch prop and that may cool them down. Escobar FPV, will your new flight controller support EMU flight? Well, EMU flight is just based on beta flight targets. So any flight controller that supports beta flight supports EMU flight. So the answer to that is yes, Escobar. Team Gantum, thank you for $2 in the super chat. What is the easiest DJI three inch bind and fly to free sky available? You want to bind it to free sky. That's tough, Team Gantum. Um, most of the DJI three inch bind and flies just expect you to use the DJI controller. Uh, what DJI, pardon me guys. <coughs> what DJI bind and fly can be ordered with a free sky controller? Let me know in the chat. Doghouse FPV in the discord wants to know, how close can the props get to each other on a build before efficiency is compromised? How close can they get? Yeah. Um, the, the truth is that the prop has a vortex of air spilling off the end of the prop. And when the prop tips get too close together, that does interact in a way that compromises efficiency. I don't know a rule of thumb for how, you know, how close, how far apart they need to be before that becomes an issue. Um, somewhere out there, there's an aeronautical engineer who could just say, oh yeah, it's a one eighth of the prop diameter times the core divided by four or something like that. Um, I don't know what it is, but the truth is a lot of times on these five inch quads, efficiency isn't the number one thing we're concerned about anyway. Like we're, they're just, they're, they're powerful. They're not efficient. So it's like saying, I'm going to have a 800 horsepower sports car. And I'm going to change the shape of the mirror to give me, you know, 
an eighth of a mile per gallon improvement. It's like, well, you're already not getting, you're already getting 10 miles to the gallon. Who cares? Just, you know, just, just go for it. Um, yeah. Redbeard, the pilot in the Discord says, I've encountered an odd issue. The Zoe FPV's gem fan props have a short hub size, but I unwittingly bought Zing E budget motors that don't have enough hub height. Are there any risks of 3D printing TPU washers to snug things up? Uh, Redbeard, I think you would probably be okay. Um, when I've done, we, uh, we did a Rotoride episode once and it, it, it never got released because it never worked. But I'm not going to tell you what it was in case somehow it gets released and I ruin it. But we were 3D printing something that would go on a prop hub. And the problem is that props spin so fast that if there is the tiniest bit of imbalance, then it just tears itself apart. I think you would be okay, though, with just a 3D printed bushing, like an, a TPU bushing, because it's solid. It's close to the hub. The problem is if it's a little off balance, it could give you vibrations. But I don't, I, I think the risk is you could get increased vibrations, but I don't think you're gonna like destroy anything. It sounds like, he, Skidush, it sounds like he needs like a millimeter. He needs like two, he says two to three millimeter washers. So it sounds like a typical, like a popo pad wouldn't work because those just aren't big enough. <laughs> Let's see here. You're going to want it as lightweight as possible, and you're going to want it to be as balanced as possible. Um, Pilot8091 says, where's the rest of your comment, Pilot8091? He's talking about prop tips being too close together. Pilot8091 is an aerospace engineer. Hey, I said I knew he was out there. Pilot8091 says, aerospace engineer here, basically any props nearby to each other will feed off of the air of the other props. The vortex area above the prop is wider than the prop itself. So ideally they should be as far away as possible. Interesting. So what Pilot is saying is that the issue is not the tip vortices spilling over and interacting, but the issue is that if you think about the negative pressure area that the prop is drawing in air, the prop is drawing in air like from a, a mushroom or a conical area. And if the two props are close together, they will pull from the same overlapping negative pressure area and will make them less efficient or less, less able to make thrust. So in that case, it's not the tip distance. It's more like the, you really need them much further apart than you would think if you were just thinking about the prop vortices or the tip vortices. He goes on to say, even when the props are right on top of each other, efficiency isn't seriously compromised, so it doesn't actually matter. Oh, yeah, I'm thinking about the case where you have two coaxial props. They're literally right on top of each other. You do get some loss of a thrust from the bottom prop, but people say that it's not as much as you would think. I don't know. Well, an aerospace engineer says it's not actually that big of a deal. Okay. <laughs> Subvids wants to know when I will upload the Sedora SL5 tuning video. Um, Subvids, uh, the 6S one I haven't made yet, so I will only upload it after I make it. Um, if we actually take a look, you can find, you can find, where is it? Oh, it's not linked, is it? Maybe I ought to put this in a link. This isn't linked from my webpage, but if you have the URL, you can actually find my editorial calendar. My editorial calendar is posted here on the website and I have the Betaflight 4.2 Pidtune 6S scheduled for Thursday of this week. Now bear in mind, I often shuffle this around. Like if it gets to Wednesday and I haven't done this yet, I may shuffle this around. So don't take this as set in stone. This is like the, the snapshot of my current intent. Um, but you could always go, I try to keep it updated. Like if I decide to push a video back, then I try to shuffle this to reflect the current state. But uh, you can always go check and see what's coming up on my, on my channel by checking this URL. Let's see here. 
Cody SA, thank you for seven Canadian dollars. I got three rush tiny tanks all lose signal when I look away on the bench. They're set to 200 milliwatts. I think, Cody, that they must be in pit mode. So if you have beta flight VTX tables and VTX tables are set up wrong, the video transmitter will go into either 25 milliwatts or pit mode. So the first thing I would do, Cody, is in the beta flight ports tab, turn off smart audio. And if that fixes the problem, you know that smart audio is screwing things up. Um, my guess is it's in pit mode, and that's why that's happening. Redbeard the pilot is also an aerospace engineer. Talking about inflow factors for a prop. Very interesting. Interesting. Hang on. Here's the picture we were looking at. The inflow of air to a propeller disc. So it looks like it's not really a mushroom or a cone. It really does look like it's a cylinder, just a slightly larger cylinder than the prop. Interesting. The other thing that has to be kept in mind with a quadcopter is that the prop's motion through the air is not perpendicular to the prop's plane. So with an airplane, the prop is moving directly forward perpendicular to the prop's uh, orientation. But with a quadcopter, the prop is usually not perpendicular to the direction of motion, so the airflow gets really wonky. Uh, it's pretty, pretty crazy, actually. Thank you, Johnny DRC, for $5 in the Super Chat. Everyday Man's Review asks, will the FAA regulate sub-250 gram quads? Uh, the answer to that is impossible to predict. Um, there have been some statements uh, by the FAA that quad weight may not be the best criteria to choose to regulate based off of. But there have been no specific moves against sub-250 gram quads at this time. Um, is there a difference in output power on radios between FCC and EU firmware? What's the difference? Um, the main, I don't think there's a difference in output power, although I could be wrong about that. So take that with a grain of salt. The big difference seems to be with telemetry. They limit the output power of the receiver when it transmits telemetry data, or they disable telemetry entirely to keep the receiver from transmitting. Um, but I don't know any more details than that. Let's see here. Good starter FPV drone for an 11 year old, asks Tommy Ron Kanan. I was thinking the Tiny Hawk kit as it comes with the controller. Uh, Tommy, I'm a fan of the Tiny Hawk ready to fly kit just because it's everything you need in one and it's cheap. It's 160 bucks and you literally have everything you need to get in the air. And so many people maybe think they want to get into FPV, but they're not sure and they don't know if they want to spend 500, 600, 1000 dollars. For 160 bucks, you're in the air. You can get a sense of if it's going to hook you, and and I think that's just pretty easy. So yeah, I like that idea. Um, what do you think of mixing different brands of ESCs that have the same specs? Asks Evan Bourgeois. Um, I don't think you're going to notice a difference. If they're all BL Heli ESCs and they all have the same settings, I don't think you're going to notice a difference. Moritz Abresh wants to know a 150 euro freestyle quad to build by myself. Moritz, um, the Eosheen Tyro line will get you in under 150 euros. It is barely adequate in terms of quality. The only thing that makes it sort of acceptable is that it isn't it isn't awful and it's really cheap it's about a hundred dollars for the tyro 119 i think maybe 110 the tyro 79 is maybe even a little cheaper than that um i think that the place where most people should start with a build if they can is closer to the 200 dollars price point if you do a hundred dollar build, you will end up replacing some of those parts sooner rather than later. That's just what you accept to get down to a hundred dollars. But you can get into the air for a hundred dollars. Um, if you can get closer to two hundred dollars, there are some better sort of kits. In fact, I actually 
am going to... Ooh, should I announce this? I guess I'll... Wait, for the people watching the live stream only. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to be putting out a build kit with GetFPV in the next month or so, probably. It'll be a, a few weeks before it's even begin, re start recording it. But um, I did my Tyro 119 series, which the goal was just to find a kit that was internationally available. So you order from Banggood so you can get it from any, to any country and was as cheap as possible. Well, this GetFPV kit is obviously going to ship from GetFPV, but also it's going to be a little, it's going to be closer to the $200 price point and have a little higher quality parts. So, Copper Top, thank you for $5. What are your thoughts on Steel's 2306 Silk Motors? Worth it or look elsewhere? Um, I think that there are value motors in the $14 to $18 price point that are going to give a lot of what most pilots want. Uh, when you're buying $26, $27 motors, you aren't necessarily getting a motor. And that's true for all of them, including mine. You aren't necessarily getting a motor that's 65% better. You're, you're, you're trying to get a specific thing out of the motor, okay? Um, and it doesn't mean that that's the only way to get that thing. It just means that you know that you're getting it. So if you want to build a Mr. Steel build, then you're going to want to use his exact parts. But if you're just wanting to build kind of like a good freestyle quad, there's a lot of 14 to 18, maybe $20 motors that could probably do just as good for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my opinion about that. Thank you, Eric Allen, for $10 in the Super Chat. Thank you, House of TJ, for $2. How do I update the R1 receiver? How do I restore the factory firmware? Um, House of TJ, the Jumper R1 receiver, I'm like 99% sure it uses FreeSky XJT firmware. So you flash it just like you flash any other FreeSky receiver using the smart port wire. And there are various tutorials online about how to flash it. Uh, you can flash it from, well, if you have a jumper, you can't, you, ha you have to flash it from the back bay pins. You can't, if you have a free sky radio, you can flash it from one of the plug on the bottom of the radio, uh, or you can flash it using serial pass through. I have tutorials about mm, those methods, um, but you want the XJT firmware. You can download it from free sky's website. It uses the same firmware. Johnny DRC, thanks for $5. Uh, Johnny says, thanks for all the help. Um, Arthur... Uh, thank you for another 25 uh, PLN. Um, changing NTSC or PAL is not working. After I connect the camera, it looks like the whole VTX shuts down. The LEDs on the VTX are going out. Well, if you connect a component and then stuff shuts down, it makes me think that component has a short circuit in it that is causing the regulator to shut down. So if the camera and the VTX are both powered from the 5 volt or the 9 volt regulator, the same regulator, and you connect the camera, and everything shuts down, then it's that says to me the camera is damaged and has a short circuit in it. Try a new camera. Um, Fear for Fun says, oh, Fear for Fun in the Discord says, I just had my whole charging setup stolen. Can you spoil your Wednesday video and let us know your thoughts on the M6D? Well, for, for a patron in the Discord, I guess I will. Let's get a, let's get a picture up of the M6D. This is the Toolkit RC M6D charger. Um, I have had one of these on my bench for the uh, last, let's uh, about a month, maybe six or eight weeks even. I'm not sure when exactly I got it. Uh, I have been testing this and I'm testing it because the Toolkit RC M8 charger had a lot of problems. It was 40 bucks. The dollars per watt of the Toolkit RC M8 was amazing but the quality it had a lot of, i got a lot of reports of people having problems with it so when toolkit rc sent me the m6 i said huh you know the m8 was a real problem and they said no no we have a new factory we're not using the same manufacturer we know and i was like okay but then i i waited i've been using it for as long as i said six or eight weeks maybe definitely a month because i didn't want to i was like well, we're gonna see and so far i mean it feels really solid I haven't had any issues with it. That doesn't mean that you won't have an issue with it. Uh, it's only a sample size of one, but what can you do? The price for performance is pretty impressive, and it's really small for a 500 milliwatt charger. Um, 65 bucks. 
500 watts, I believe that is 500 watts total, 250 watts per channel. Pretty impressive, honestly. Um, the main thing that differentiates this from my, uh, my, my current favorite charger, which is the Hoda D6 Duo, not the D6 Pro, but the D6 Duo. I have like four of these D6 Duos. Here we go. Uh, the D6 Duo can be ordered with an AC. Holy crap, no. Where's the A D6 Pro? That's... AC, there we go. So the, for 118 bucks, you can get the D6 Pro with an AC a, a power supply built in, which is great for travel. This is what I take with me when I travel. Because, okay, it's 200 watts per channel, I'm pretty sure. 200 watts per channel. It's so... No, is it 200 watts total? Oh, uh, that's... I can't even freaking tell. Is it 200 watts total? It says supports power distribution. That makes me think it's 200 watts total on AC. But the thing is, when I go on the road, it's just one thing to grab. It plugs into the wall. I've charged my packs slowly. I get it done. It's all good. Um, when you run it on a DC, it's 650 watts. So it's more output power. But this guy here is 65 bucks. It seems like it's really good for taking to the taken to the field if you want to charge it off your car or something, or if you have a big 6S battery or a zinc, uh, you know, a lead acid battery uh, that you use in the field, it's really small. And uh, for 65 bucks for 500 watts is pretty impressive. So I think I'm going to recommend it with the caveat that you can't know for sure. Like the, the Hobby Mate, the Hoda D6, it's, it's been solid forever. We can be reasonably confident that it's going to stay solid. The Toolkit RC is a new product. It could turn out to be crap. We can't know. Okay. Anders Martinson in the Discord says, I did some research, saw some people using a cigarette lighter in a car to power a charger. What are your thoughts? Um, yeah. The only thing is that the cigarette lighter sometimes is fused at 10 amps. So you want to make sure you don't exceed 120 watts. It may be fused at 15 amps, in which case you would, you know, 15 times whatever your voltage times 12 volts. Um, you just want to make sure you don't exceed that power draw and pop the fuse. But if you just do the math, most chargers, if not all chargers, have the ability to limit the input power. So just limit that to the point where you don't pop your fuse. And yeah, the, uh, the other thing is, if you're charging based off the cigarette lighter, you probably are charging inside the car, and if it lights on fire, you're going to have a bad day. So that's the big reason not to charge off the cigarette lighter. You, if you're charging and it's up under your hood and it lights on fire, you have a much better chance of not lighting your whole car on fire. And I say this as the voice of experience. I have thankfully never lit my car on fire by having a battery light up. But I know two examples just here in Knoxville. In one case, a guy lit his engine compartment on fire, charging batteries under the hood. That was it wasn't closed, but it was just sitting there, alligator clipped to the to the uh, to the battery. And in another case, a person lit their interior on fire, charging like in the passenger seat. And I, I know which one of those two people I would rather be because one of them drove away. I guess the other one probably drove away too. Like the whole car didn't go up. But yeah, best way to connect to the car battery is with alligator clips, right? Alligator clips right onto the, onto the uh, lugs. Zontar in the Discord wants to know, does, does calibrating the M8 fix the issues? Well, one of the problems that the M8 had was it was arriving miscalibrated and charging wrong. Um, maybe calibrating fixes it in some cases, but that's just not acceptable. It's not acceptable for, it has to come, it doesn't have to be like down to the millivolt. But it has to be pretty close, and they weren't coming that way. Other people were having issues with it failing, reliability issues with the M8. Yeah. Moisha, Moisha Pittsburgh in the YouTube chat asks, what do you think about cleaning your drone? I don't clean mine at all. I don't at all clean them ever. The only thing I clean is the camera lens so I can see. The rest of it, sorry, man. Thank you, JCC, for 1099 euros in the super chat. 
No question, just thanks and hello from Germany. Ezekiel 1974, thanks for five bucks. Your thoughts, your thoughts on the Futaba 18SZ versus the Radio Master TX16S. Like they're not even, there's no comparison. That's like saying your thoughts on, you know, like a freaking Mercedes versus a Honda Civic. They're just two different products for two different people. What does a Futaba 18SZ cost? Futaba 18SZ. Oh my god. For real? For real. Okay, that's the 70th anniversary edition. Okay. Futaba 18SZ. Thousand bucks. The 70th anniversary edition is $1,600. So, I mean, like, why would you, why would you ask, how does a thousand dollar radio compare to a Hundred and sixty dollar radio. Here's the here's the thing. Like, they they they're just not for the same person. Is the Futaba a better radio than the Radio Master? For freaking a thousand dollars, it damn well better be. But for a typical person getting into the hobby, is the Futaba necessary? No. You could fly. I'm I'm you know I've flown the Jumper T16 as my daily driver for the last, since October, 2019, it's fine. Would I be happier with the Futaba? I mean, the gimbals are probably nicer. The switches, I bet money the switches are about the same. Switches are just kind of switches. Maybe they're like ultra premium switches. The quality of the radio board, the quality of the manufacturing is probably higher. Like this whole issue with the ribbon cables never would have happened with the Futaba. But you're paying like all, oh, eight times as much for the radio. There's no way I would spend $1,000 on a radio, even if it was better, which it probably is. The other thing about the Futaba is it doesn't run OpenTX, and I'm a big fan of OpenTX. Oh, man. That's not how to get me to answer the question, Kishan Joshi. It's not how to do it, my friend. That's how to get put in timeout. Anders Martinson says, what if Futaba sent you the radio? Well, first of all, I don't think they will because I'm already such a big visible proponent of budget radios that I doubt they would send it to me unless I like, I mean, it's a $1,000 radio. But um, the thing is, I've gotten some flack. I got some flack. Uh, there was a viewer who said, I used to be a fan of Bardwell until he became, he just promotes all this cheap Chinese bottom dollar crap. And this person was basically saying that if I really cared about you guys, I wouldn't be reviewing and promoting cheap crap. I would be promoting better quality, more expensive stuff. Um... And, you know, it, especially as my channel got more popular, it there was a point where I decided to actively avoid the temptation to just upgrade everything to the best, which I have the, I can do. Because if I said to Futaba, I will use your radio exclusively and I will not promote other radios anymore, they would send me the most expensive Futaba radio. I guarantee it. I just get, I mean, that's, that's as easy. Um, but I was like, who, who's my, who do I serve? And the people that I most feel connected to and most want to serve are the people who are just getting into the hobby and are on a budget. And so I want, I don't promote cheap crap. I, I mean, I don't think it's crap. Like I said, I eat my own dog food. I flew the Jumper T16 as my daily driver for the last, since October. You know, um, I remember wanting to get into FPV and looking at the available radios and seeing that they cost three, four, five, six hundred dollars. And when like, I guess I'm never going to get into this hobby because I will never spend that much on a radio, not even knowing if I'm really going to like it. And then I found the Turnigy 9X for 60 bucks. And that's the reason I'm here today. And that's who I think of when I promote cheap crap. Is this a radio as good as a Turnigy 
No. I mean, a, a, a Futaba? No. Not in any world is this made to the same standards as a, as a Futaba. But is it a radio? Is it like okay for 130, 160 bucks? Yeah, 100%. So. Hmm. Anyway, thank you for your super chat. JCC, yep, got you. Okay, we're caught up on super chats. The other thing is that, like, you don't have to spend $900 on a Futaba to get a good radio. TBS Tango 2 is a very good radio. It's unfortunate that it only sports Crossfire because I feel like that's a deal breaker for me. But it's a very well manufactured radio at a price of about 140 bucks. Like, I would, I, I haven't been to the factory, but I'd bet that the manufacturing sort of quality oversight testing on the Tango 2 is better than the Radio Master. I'm mean, going to just bet. Ben A and D wants to know if I have a list of my upcoming videos. Ben, I just showed my editorial calendar earlier in the stream. You can see that right at that link. Let's see here. Hmm. Ch ah, says, how do I set up failsafe on a DJI controller? And by the way, yes, that is how he spelled his name or she. Um, it, you don't. Uh, with DJI, you, you set failsafe in the flight controller. What if you're using a... What if you're not using a flight controller? I have no idea. Okay. Anders Martinson points out there is a very high chance TBS is releasing a multi-protocol module for the Tango 2. There were heavy inferences made on the TBS couch. I have also heard that rumor and hope that it's true. The, the TBS Tango, if you like the game controller style radio, it is it has so many good things going for it, except that it doesn't buy... If there was a multi-protocol module for the Tango 2, it would go up so much higher in my estimation. I'm not saying I would switch to it because the game controller style radios, I don't prefer the ergonomics of them, but um, a lot of people do. So, yeah, I think I think the people who want me to promote more expensive stuff, like I, I don't think they have a grasp on just how little money so many people have to spend on the hobby. Like, yeah, I don't know. That's just where my heart's at. That's just where my heart's at. I mean, I have a freaking Torval bag. Okay, so like a Torval bag is like a $300 bag, and I think it's awesome, and I love it, and it's the best. Um, and like I'm not, I'm not going to carry around a $60 like real ACC bag or something from Banggood. I'm just like, screw it, I'm spending $300. I didn't, they sent me one. I'm like, forget it. I'm just going to splurge on my bag. I'm going to be just the snobby YouTuber who gets stuff for free uh, when it comes to my bag. But when it comes to my controller, nah, this is fine. I like this. It's cheap. It's cheerful. It's a job done. Hopefully it doesn't betray us all. Mm. Pamela Strickland don't give me too much credit I do like money Pamela Strickland says Joshua has actual ethics not the quote unquote ethics of greed don't get me wrong I mean I, I, I like to I like money I like to pay the bills um, I just do that by answering all your emails for hours and hours a day and then you join my Patreon for as little as $2 a month or more if you feel like I've earned it and thankfully, those kind of things get the job done. So I've kind of I've kind of painted myself into a corner here, because if one day I do come out and go, I'm only flying this expensive stuff. Buy my buy my hoodie, buy my you know, and just just decide to shift gears and become just a brand something or other. All my followers will be like, Oh, okay, we're out of here. So now I have to just keep doing the right thing. <laughs> Nathan T in the Discord says DJI Air Unit is connected to the Kakute F7 HDV and bench testing. There is no battery voltage in the OSD. What am I missing? Nathan T, I'm very sorry to tell you. 
Holy Bro ships the Kakute F7 HDV with the same target as their analog flight controller. They didn't make a different target for the HDV, and that means that it doesn't come with the ports tab set correctly. You need to go into the ports tab and enable MSP on the whichever UART it is. Let's look. Let's look up the Kakute F7 HDV. I wish... When I reviewed Cinewhoops, I told them about this. I said, you should change this. I guess they haven't. Disappointing. Disappointed. That's what I have to say. Disappointed. Wait a minute. This isn't my world. Disappointed! <laughs> yeah, I'm disappointed. Um, where is the user manual? There we go. So if we look at the HDV pinout, what we're going to see is... Where's the... There we go. Here we go. This is what we want. This is the pinout of the DJI plug. T1 and R1... So that's for the MSP connection. So in the ports tab, you need uh, MSP enabled for UART 1, and you need serial receiver enabled for UART 6. So that's what's going on there. NL Anaconda wants to know, when I trained enough in the simulator, what camera angle should I use on my first drone? I suggest about, maybe if you, I mean, whatever you're using in the simulator. So if you're practicing in the simulator at 45 degrees, then that's probably what you should use in real life because that's what you'll be used to. But I think a good starting camera angle is about 20, 25 degrees. Is there a boot button? Yeah, there's a boot button. They have a bootloader button on all their flight controllers. Yeah, here it is. It's to the left of the, um, it's to the left of the ESC plug. I'm thinking this is the bootloader button, just to the side of the ESC plug. Come on. LFM Rad FPV, thank you for five euros. Any range related issues when bottom mounting the T crossfire antenna versus on the arm? Is this okay? Um, it's gonna, yeah, you're gonna get reduced range anytime you occlude the antenna. So anytime the antenna is blocked by any obstacle, coverage is gonna be reduced. But here's the thing crossfire has such ridiculous range to begin with you're probably not going to notice, but I wouldn't mount the antenna this way. And here's why. Oh, come on. Zoom in. You're going to rip it off. You're going to rip it off in a crash. You're totally going to rip it off. Even just landing. You're going to rip it off when landing. That's maybe these motor mounts are going to give you enough uh, height to protect it. I wouldn't mount it this. I wouldn't mount it on the bottom like that. I wouldn't mount it on the arm either. LFM Rad asks, what about on the arm? I don't like mounting it on the end of the arm. It gets beat up too easily. I mount it off the rear. That is the way that, to me, gives the most durability. It's not the absolute best for range. The absolute best for range is having it stuck up in the air, but mm, Crossfire has so much range anyway that it kind of doesn't matter most of the time. So, Jackson Pfeffer, thank you for a $30 super chat. That's a big super chat. Happy Father's Day. You've been a huge help to me getting in the hobby. Thank you so much. Happy Father's Day to you if you are, in fact, a father. Max Babik, thank you for two euros. Do 10 millimeter bearings in the Cyber Zing motor make a difference? I mean, we, we don't have enough data to say for sure, but yeah, we, we, it's expected that the 10 millimeter bearings in the Cyber Zing motors will improve durability. In general, a larger bearing is going to improve durability. Um, probably. I mean, it's hard to say, but probably, probably. Time will tell. Um, Mick Awesome wants to know what I think of the T-Motor Pacer 4-in-1 ESC. I don't know what to make of the T-Motor Pacer ESC. It's colored. It's painted with this, like, um, with this, like, paint scheme. But it's a 60-amp ESC for, like, 40 bucks or something. And I'm like, okay. Or is that the Velox? I'm kind of confused by T-Motor's latest ESC lineup. Like, I'm not sure what the differences are between the two, like the, the Velox and the T-Motor F55A. Is it higher, 
higher voltage feds. Um, based on T Motors' reputation as a manufacturer, I would probably feel safe recommending it if that's what the direction you're going. How do I even measure my camera angle on my quad? Asks Silverhammer. Silverhammer, what I recommend you do is you... So this is actually more complicated than you think. Because just because you point your camera at the same up tilt angle doesn't mean that... Because sometimes the sensor in the camera is slightly off. What I would suggest you do is you put your quad like on a desk or a table. You measure the height of the camera off the ground right like to the center of the lens i guess and then you tilt the quad forward while looking in the goggles until a line you're gonna have to like mark a line ahead of you you, you follow me you mark a line on a wall just ahead of you at the height of the camera and you tilt the quad forward until in the goggles you see that line centered as if it was the horizon. And then you look in your accelerometer tab, you look in the setup tab at the accelerometer and you look at the pitch angle and that'll tell you how many degrees of up tilt you've got. Um, it, you can also just eyeball it by looking at the camera angle. Just pit, tilt the quad forward until the camera lens looks perpendicular. That will get you close, but I have seen some cases where some cameras, for whatever reason, when the lens was perpendicular, the camera wasn't actually showing the same field of view. JC Horn in the Discord says, my motors are getting hot regardless of what I do with the filter sliders. So probably that just means your motors are overpropped. Your props are too large, the KV is too high, the quad is too heavy. Um, props, props are too high pitch. That's probably, if you have hot motors that don't respond to changes in the filter sliders, they're probably just overpropped. Jonas C, huh. Jonas C says, I just set up LQ for Crossfire with an aux channel on DJI. It's not a number out of 199. Well, what is it? Jonah, what is it? Absidia says, my D6 charger is set to 1S, 3.7 volts, keeps charging to 4.2. Um, Absidia, 3.7 volts is the nominal voltage, I think, maybe the problem. It's the nominal voltage of the pack, but a 1S char fully charged will be 4.2. If you want it to charge to 3.7 or whatever, you need to run the storage program, not this charge program. Silverhammer says, my RXSR has a solid blue, red, and green light when trying to bind Y. That's, that's when an RXSR is in bind mode, that sounds right to me. Jonas C says it's out of 99 instead of 300. When do I turn back? Yeah, um, if you're doing LQ that way, it's not going to go to 300. It only knows how to go to 100. Um, I'm not actually sure how LQ works when it's out of 100. Is it like 90 to 100 is mode 3? I don't know. Um, I would probably... Uh, what I've heard is that when LQ is at 70% turn back, and that's for people using 0 to 100%. So I think that's right. But 70% is actually, I think the turn back point is around 80. And like between 70 and 80, it's like, ooh, very risky. Okay. Silverhammer, the red will go off. The red LED on the RxSR will turn off when you bind, when you have bound. But in initially, initially when you power up in binding mode, it's solid. Siati FPV is here. Siati is uh, going to be coming on streaming on his channel after I finish up. Uh, Josh wants to know, what's my Discord server? The only way to find out is to pass the ultimate test. Go to patreon.com. Log in and subscribe to my Patreon for as little as $2 a month. Or more if you feel like I've earned it. It's up to you. And once you do this, you will be granted access to the Discord server.
Why is it not binding then, says Silverhammer. Okay, so what's happening, Silverhammer, if that red LED is not blinking, it's not binding. Are you using a Tyrannus x Lite? The main reason that FreeSky receiver would refuse to bind to a FreeSky controller is the firmware is mismatched. And FreeSky has really made everybody's job more difficult by releasing a ton of incompatible firmware. So there's EU versus FCC region. And if the region doesn't match, they won't bind. There's ACCST 2.0 versus pre 2.0. If you have ACCST firmware 2.1 on your controller, but pre 2.1 on your receiver, they won't bind. So basically what I would do is I would flash the res uh, like I would flash the controller and the receiver to two firmwares that I knew for a fact were compatible and see about see about making that work. I'm going to guess when you flash the F port firmware, you flashed it to an incompatible firmware with whatever is on your controller. The other problem is that there's not actually an easy way with the older controllers to know what firmware is on your XJT module. The only way to do it is to just flash it with a new firmware and then you know. Why use FreeSky over Crossfire? Asked Crazy Kid Jack. Money, that's the only reason. Crossfire is more expensive. Crossfire is better in every way. It's just more expensive. I guess on micro quads, wait. Laura Lasny wants to know, I upgraded to Betaflight on my Tiny Hawk, to Betaflight 4.1 on my Tiny Hawk S. How do I downgrade to 4.0? Um, you're going to want to get the 4.0 config dump from Emacs's website, which they post the config dump for most of their quads on their website. What's the minimum you can set for a tier on Patreon? Big data pump. I think the minimum possible tier is a dollar. I'm not sure though. Which fertilizer is best for growing cannabis? Asks the 17th floor. I would refer you to uh, my patron, It's Blunty, hence his name. He works at a grow operation in some state where that's legal, so don't freak out. Uh, he probably knows the answer. It's Blunty, if you're here, what's the best fertilizer for growing cannabis? You thought I wouldn't answer that question. That's the only reason I'm answering that question. <laughs> oh, let's see here. Do you have to upgrade your Free Sky Tyrannus if you don't want to? No, Sean Watkins, only if you want new features that have been released in the new firmware. You don't have to. Cosminel says, what do I have to do to the KISS 4-in-1 ESC to make it work, or should I use individual ESCs? Um, the people who I talked to when I told when I announced that I was going to be using the Mr. Steel uh, build said that the individual ESCs are way more robust than the 4-in-1. Like the 25-amp KISS ESCs with capacitor installed on each one very, very good, very bulletproof. Um, if you're going to do a four in one, people have been telling me that the FET tech is more robust than the uh, than the KISS ESC, uh, and that's the direction they suggest going. Um, at the very least, if you're going to use the 25 amp KISS ESC that I used on 6S, definitely put a capacitor on it, is the advice that I've been given. Let's see here. Let's see. It's Blunty says, okay, so it's Blunty's here. He's a professional marijuana grower. The best fertilizer, he says, organic is BS. You're just growing the microbes to make the salts. It's the same thing with an extra step. Don't need organic fertilizer. Oh. Organics are easier for newer growers or old school school guys. Yeah, I mean, I've never grown marijuana, but I have grown a garden. Organic fertilizer, the advantage of compost is that it's basically impossible to like over fertilize and burn the plants the, or the compost releases the nutrients slower um, and they're just not as concentrated. So they, uh, 
they release it slower. Trouble Solver just gave a thousand Norwegian kroner. I don't know what the conversion is, but that seems like a lot. It's a hundred dollars. Wow, thank you, Trouble Solver, for the super chat. No question. Just a thousand dollar, a thousand kroner super chat. Hundred dollars. Thank you, Trouble Solver, for the donation. Uh, Nay Diesel Girl. The Diesel Girl, thank you for 10 bucks. I will be flying in sunny 100-degree desert weather in New Mexico. Any tips regarding heat? Um, is there ever a time to use heat sinks on your electronics? Uh, Diesel Girl, um, the electronics are usually fine because they're cooled by the airflow from the props. Uh, the, big, the big concern is the video transmitter, but again, it's usually fine. Everything else usually doesn't get too hot to begin with. And then you've got the motors. So... If you are in Michigan in the winter and it's 30 degrees, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, it's zero degrees centigrade, you could tune the crap out of your filters and your D-gains and your motors will never get hot because it's just so damn cold out. But then if you take that same quadcopter to Dubai and it's 110 degrees Fahrenheit, suddenly you don't have as much margin to tune your filters and your D-gains without getting hot motors. So the number one place where ambient temperature affects, I think, is in your ability to push filters and degains without overheating your motors. You're probably going to need more filtering, cleaner motors, better balanced props to get away with not smoking your motors. But other than that, it's probably not a huge difference. Gaddafi, thank you for $10. Just got a Cadex Vista. I got OSD working and RSSI on the Tango 2 shows 88 RSSI is the highest. Any reason? Um, Gaddafi, I'm going to guess that you're seeing the actual RSSI. Um, uh, a lot of people who set up their Crossfire system were looking at a synthetic combination of LQ and RSSI. And the takeaway is that link quality can be high even as RSSI goes down until you get to a point where it all just sort of falls apart. Okay. <laughs> But LQ takes into account interference as well as signal strength. So you would see 99 RSSI, but it actually was 99 LQ. And you would never go down because LQ was just good forever. So my guess is that you're actually seeing RSSI, which is not really what you want. You want to be seeing LQ. So you set up RSSI as an aux channel on your flight controller, in the Crossfire configuration, you can control whether that shows LQ, RSSI, or a combination of both. Set that to LQ, and then you'll probably get the information that you actually need. Let's see here. It's Blunty continues, talking about fertilizer. All bottled nutrients are various amounts of salts suspended in liquid or organic inputs liquefied. They almost all work. I guess the takeaway is that it's not which fertilizer you choose, but that you apply it correctly in the right amounts. Yeah. He says, Fox Farm Ocean Forest Soil is hot garbage right now. They are lying about the age of the soil. I would never use it. They're spraying ammonia on it and cooking it to speed age it. We pulled soil tests on it and sent them to CSU. Okay, so that is... All I'm going to answer about the marijuana fertilizer question, which I only did because you thought I wouldn't, but I really enjoy answering your questions, and uh, I knew that It's Blunty would know the answer. If you want to talk more about marijuana, I guess you can join my Discord server, although we don't really, I mean, it's not like it's Bot Grinders Discord server. So, but hey, It's Blunty's there. <laughs> he says, send them my way. <laughs> There you go. Thank you. It's plenty for your answer. Carolos Fadi, thank you for $5 in the super chat. I have DJI goggles with rapid fire. Can't connect it to my quad. Can't search for channel. And when I manually connect, it gives me a blue screen. I guess, Carolos, I would ask how you installed. Because with the, with the rapid fire, when you change channels, the OSD should pop up. Even if you don't have video, the, the rapid fire menu should appear. So you should see that in your goggles. So if you just don't, if you get blue screen all the time, maybe your wiring isn't right, Carlos. So I would wonder what adapter you're using and how it's plugged in to the DJI goggles.
Let's see. T1 Ledley wants to know what quad would fly most like the 6S Sedora in liftoff. The truth is um, that no quads, I don't think the simulation is like you would want to get the weight and the battery voltage approximately right. But other than that, I think the differences are going to be more subtle than most simulators are really capable of discerning. So I would just pick something that's a five inch quad of on 4S with about the same weight and I would just take it from there. Let's see here. Um, FPV Junkie, OpenTX 2.3, a crossfire shot is coming in OpenTX 2.4. It's not yet available on the nightly builds or 2.3.9 or anything like that. Jeff Carr. Oh, hang on. I missed a super chat. The one Shannon, thank you for 10 bucks in the super chat. Sorry for missing your super chat 10 minutes ago. Can you divulge anything about Fat Shark's new digital system, SharkBite? The one Shannon, there's nothing to divulge. I have no information. Um, there was a public statement made uh, a little while ago, earlier this week, that it was going to be delayed further between, they said they don't know, but he said, I can't tell if it's one month or four months. So that's your window. Um, nothing more to divulge until there's an actual product in, in hand. So... Jeff Carr, thank you for five pounds in the super chat. Will Emu Flight defaults work okay on a trash can running 2S? Want to use the Project Mockingbird tune, but his latest tune is for 65 millimeter running 1S. I think that you probably won't get good results taking a 65 millimeter tune uh, and running it on 75 millimeter 2S. Um, will the defaults work okay? Impossible to predict, but in general, defaults are conservative enough that they don't make problems. So probably it'll fly, but it may not be optimal. You may want to look at the changes that Project Mockingbird made for the 65 millimeter and sort of work from the defaults towards that direction, if that makes sense. There's, don't just, I mean, heck, maybe give it a try. You never know. Melvin Chauvin wants to buy a bind and fly quad for 250 bucks. You know what I'm going to say. There, there are many out there that are worth looking at. The one that I've been impressed with lately because I've been flying it is the iFlight Sedora SL5E. David Plugi wants to, sorry, David, if I mispronounced your name, does the signal on a Cadex Vista get worse when connected to battery voltage instead of a regulator? I don't think so, David. Um, the Cadex Vista has a built-in regulator. It's made to take up to 6S voltage, and I don't think you should, I, I would worry about the 9-volt regulator dropping out, okay? So I would run it off of VBAT. Um, is this the right firmware? Let's see. Silverhammer. That is the firmware I would use, the Tyrannus X Lite 190905. I no, 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 no. That is the OpenTX firmware. Wait, but it includes the bin and the DFU file. That's OpenTX firmware. Let's share this with everybody so everybody can enjoy uh, what's what we're talking about. The question is, is this the firmware I need to install for the Tyrannus? This firmware is the OpenTX firmware. You should download this not from FreeSky because they change like the SD card contents to take Crossfire out. Download this from the OpenTX website. What you want is the XJT Lite firmware, this one here, okay? You want this one. This is your module firmware. Phantom FPV, happy Father's Day to you, sir. Good to see you in the chat. Um, I hope you saw that video we did, uh, me and Ryan Harrell about, uh, about your quad inspired by your quad, how to get, how to prevent desyncs on, on high, on high, uh, RPM quads. Oh, Gal Kremer here as well. A lot of luminaries in the chat. Nice to see you. Happy Father's Day. Thank you, Siati. Siati's here as well. Thank you. You should give that a try, Phantom. Try, try changing the ramp up power. See if it helps. I, I don't think that's something... I, I don't think you changed that. Maybe you tested it, but you didn't change it. 
Ryan Harrell is a is anytime. Oh, I'm not on screen. Anytime Ryan Harrell wants to talk about quads, uh, you know you're going to get good stuff. Carlos Fadi, thank you for five more dollars in the super chat. I'm using the the Uru AV adapter from GetFPV. Um, yeah, so I assume it's plugged in right. I guess I would try a a different module. I, I guess like you really should see the menu at least. Test your AV input using a different uh, source. Maybe your AV input is messed up somehow. Jadrian Clement, I had a small crash and my Unify HV video went dark. Then when I got home, it faded away to gray video. I think my Unify is busted. What happened? Um, I mean, you crashed. That's the story, man. I would love to like, you know, do a for forensic analysis and be like, well, you know, the capacitor over here it received a voltage. There's no way to know, but you crashed and it broke and now it's broken. That's about all there is to say. Check your antenna. Maybe your antenna got damaged. Check your camera. It's possible. Like if it's fading to black, maybe it's your camera and not your Unify. I would normally expect the Unify to go to static, not black. So maybe it's your camera, but that's all, uh, that's all I have to say. Empty my mag on you says there's a bug for DJI analog input. What's the bug, man? Is there a bug? I mean, Kieran says if it's the camera, you should still see OSD. Good point. If it grays out to, yeah, that's a good point, unfortunately. Um, empty my mag says go to settings, display, Henry Bambro, I love your enthusiasm, but I hate that you're spamming my chat. You're in timeout, my friend. Um, go to settings, display. This is for uh, Carolos Fadi. You're in settings, display, change zoom out to 80%, go back to AVN, and then you can see your image. Um, I thought that bug was fixed, though, in the latest firmware. I guess it's worth a try, Carolos Fadi. Go to settings display, change the zoom out to 80%, then go back to AV in, and then you can zoom back out to 100%. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. Leon Koenig wants to know if I have any tips for a workbench. I like to use a magnetic knife rack to hold my tools. That's what I would say. Do you think we'll ever see a standalone digital VTX from DJI or a licensed manufacturer? What do you mean by standalone VTX? Don't we have that now? Do you mean a receiver? Like a receiver module, Kristen? Christian? <laughs> Thank you for $5 in the super chat. Can you suggest an antenna upgrade for the stock ones on the Fat Shark Attitude V5s? I mean... Uh, my website, fpvknowitall.com, has various recommendations for antennas. Um, I'm a big fan of the Vaz Ion antenna, the Vaz Ion V2, actually, and the um, True RC uh, Crosshair or the Vaz Crosshair Extreme. We also looked earlier at the Lumineer Axi Duo, which is a decent antenna. All of those are good. Pixel Pusher says every time I change a channel on my Rapid Fire, the DJI goggles completely reset and show the DJI logo again. Okay, that's definitely not right. I would be wondering, yeah, no, that's that's definitely not right. That should never happen. Oh my goodness gracious. That is not how to get me to answer your question. Oh, I just put the wrong guy in timeout. I apologize. That is not how to get me to answer my question, my friend. That is just how to get me to put you in timeout and never answer your question. Like, I understand you want to you wanna get your question answered, but... Yeah. I'm not obligated to answer any specific question, but if you do, if you really want me to answer your question, leaving a super chat is the way to do it. Speaking of that, it starts. Thank you for $5. Now that I have five broken quads, I have time to learn 3D printing. When will we have 3D printing live streams? I don't know about that. What do you even do on a 3D printing live stream? <laughs> I don't know about that. Oh, Bastion Sonderman. Nice stick overlay in the latest video. How did you get it? Well, Bastion, uh, that's because you made a cool utility. 
Let's share this with the world, Bastion. Bastion, post a link to your uh, utility. Um, it'll get, it'll get, it'll get uh, caught up, but I'll approve it. Post a link to your utility. Uh, Bastion Sonderman made a cool stick overlay utility. It does the same thing as Blackbox Log Viewer does, but it does it way faster. Blackbox Log Viewer is so inefficient and slow; it takes forever to generate stick overlays. Bastion made a utility that it's also way crisper. It has. Yeah, post a link, Bastion. I will approve it. If you want to, like, how many people out there need a stick overlay? But if you want to do that, uh, this is a great tool to do it. Let's see here. Ooh, got some thunderstorm coming in, guys. We are 15 minutes away from the end of the stream. Aaron Ciotti is in the stream. He's going to be streaming at 15, in three, in 15 minutes, whatever time it is for you. He's going to be streaming soon. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Where is it, Bastion? Where's your, G, where's your, uh, where's your GitHub? Where's your GitHub link, Bastion? Hold on. Where is it? I'm trying to find it. See, this is why. Oh, I found it. There you go. This is the link, guys. So, Bastion Sonderman, uh, he made this. It's up on GitHub. Um, if you would like to generate stick overlays from black box files, this is a thousand, maybe literally a thousand times faster than black box. Um, and he has been working on it with a little bit of help. And it renders multiple files at once. The file has transparency. It has an alpha channel built in, so you don't have to do any keying on it. It's really nice. It's really nice. So you can check that out. Henry Bambro, thank you. No problem about the spam, Henry. What are you trying to ask me, man? Is it possible that high KV motors cause jello when my battery's full? Yeah, it's possible. If you only get the vibration when the battery's full, it means the increased RPM is just ramping up the vibration, you see? So it just means the vibrations are probably there when the battery voltage gets lower, but the motor RPM is slower, and therefore you don't notice it. So yeah, that's definitely possible. Higher voltage can also cause gyro problems. Sometimes you get gyro noise at high voltage, but not at lower voltage because it increases the noise to the gyro chip itself. Aaron Johnson says, thank you for 20. So Wheatish Kroner, how important is the VRX module for long range? Yeah, very important, Aaron. If you're going to do long range, you want the most sensitive receiver module you can get. Uh, Rapid Fire and TBS Fusion are two really good ones. Then you're going to want a high power video transmitter and you're going to want a higher gain antenna on the receiver. Chris Whitehead, thank you for two pounds. AliExpress $54 F7 stack from Hyphen RC. Any good? I don't know. I have no experience with them. You're taking a chance ordering a, a no name brand at flight controller off of AliExpress, but maybe it's good. Could be good. Don't know. Is 10 volt the voltage maximum to run a flight controller and receiver? Asks TVPC 1971. Um, many receivers are rated up to 10 volt. Free Sky receivers, for example, are typically rated up to 10 volts. You would want to check for your specific flight controller and receiver, though. Don't make an assumption and fry something. Jack Murray wants a big FOV goggle under 300 pounds. What do you recommend? I mean, if you really want a large FOV, Jack, box goggles are going to deliver, but you may not want a box goggle. The problem is that when you go to micro displays like a Fat Shark or a Sky Zone goggle, they get way, way more expensive. You're just not going to get a big field of view for 300. The closest you could get, I guess, is the EV200. EV200D, I guess, is the closest you're going to get. But even that is not, like, massive. 
Pretty fly for a white guy. Says, Zoe, is that Slab City? Why didn't you go? Well, Slab City is not in Knoxville. It's not in Tennessee. So it's all the way out wherever she is. So it is 2.50 p.m. We are 10 minutes from the end of the stream. And um, and uh, Aaron Ciotti is here. Aaron, uh, go ahead and post your live stream link. Um, in fact, I, I'm, I might be ending the stream slightly early because I'm not sure I'm going to make it to the end of the stream because I drank so much liquid at the beginning of the stream. And I've been slowly waiting to see if I'm going to make it. And I'm starting to think maybe I'm not. <laughs> uh, how do you switch beta flight to dark mode? The answer is here and here. That's how. So Ciotti, get ready to go, dude. I may be bailing for you, man. <laughs> uh, Scout, yeah, the Scout is good. The Ishin EV800D is good. No way, no way, Julian S. We're not doing, we're not doing the bottle trick on a on a live stream. That's not. That's not. YouTube would not appreciate that. Coelho, I missed your super chat. What? Coelho FPV. I'm so sorry I missed your super chat, my friend. If I have a three thousand milliamp hour lithium ion, should I see the same capacity as I see on lipos? Um, in general, th lithium ion is higher density than lithium polymer. Lithium polymer is higher discharge rate. However, the fact that it's rated for 3,000 milliamp hours doesn't mean that you're going to get 3,000 milliamp hours out of it. At the end of the day, one thing to keep in mind is that lithium ions may be designed to discharge below 3.0 volts per cell. You may need to look at the spec sheet for your battery, and you may see that it's designed for discharge down as low as 2.8 or 2.7 volts. That could be where the additional milliamp hours are coming from. So, wow, big thunderstorm coming in. Big thunderstorm coming. Aaron Ciotti, my friend, where is that, uh, where's that, uh, link, buddy? He's not here. He thinks, he thinks we're getting out of here at seven, at three. Jadrian Clement, are five volt TBS Unify is okay to run off of any five volt pin? You need to make sure that it has, uh, like, if it's a five volt you know, 800 milliamp, then no. You need like at least like an amp, maybe an amp and a half. If the five volt regulator is not up to the demand, then it will not work well. All right, guys. Wow. Big storm coming. That's all I can think about. Maybe that's, uh, maybe that's why I'm feeling a particular urgency. That rainstorm coming in is just, uh, uh, Nathan T. I got the hundred dollars super chat, my friend. I got it. I called it out. Thank you that for that big donation. There's Ciotti. Ciotti is Insta 360 go and fixing everything. Um, Ciotti is here. Did I catch a new intro yet? Ha ha. All right, guys. Well, we're five minutes till the end of the stream, but I am going to call this so that I can go uh, relieve myself. I don't know why. Most live streams I make it through. Some live streams I drink two bottles, but today I'm going to call the live stream and going to go uh, take care of some business. That's going to do it. I will see you guys Monday night. Tomorrow night at 8 p.m. will be in my next live stream. And I will see you there, but that's going to do it. Siadi, if you want to start five minutes early, go for it, man. Bye, everybody.